We're just 47 meters away from Dicerus bicornis bicornis, or more commonly known as the desert black rhino. He's incredibly aware that we're here. And you're lucky, because this is a rare sighting. Stay tuned. She's traveling through the wild. She's searching for the truth. A true ninja's child. She's gonna find the proof. Picking up the trail. She's gonna find the answer. She's gonna tell the tale. She's gonna tell the tale. Keep it wild. Keep it free. This could be our last chance to see. Damaraland is one of the more scenic spots in Namibia. Prehistoric watercourses that open up onto plains of grassland. This vast landscape is dotted by massive granite kopjes and rust-tinged mountains. Hello and welcome to Wild Limited. I'm Michelle garforth fenter Can you hear it? The silence. Namibia is definitely a place for the soul. And despite the perennial heat and dryness, the animals, plants and trees of Damaraland have survived by adapting to the rigours of life in a place where it might only rain two or three times a year. Today, we're going to be braving the fiery heat in one of Namibia's last great wilderness areas as we go in search of some highly adapted mammals who call the scorching landscape home. Namibia truly is a place for the soul, and it never ceases to amaze me just how quiet this desert landscape is. So quiet, in fact, that you can hear the beating of insect wings as they zoom past you. It shimmers in the heat and it looks oh so pretty. It's called Namibian snow. What you're actually looking at are the seed pods from the Bosman's silky grass. And if you have a look at these pods here in my hand, they get airborne really easily and they'll travel kilometers and then take seed in some of the harshest territory. If we have a look on the ground here, you'll notice that the little seeds have found lots of different spots amongst the grass to germinate. And once they've germinated, the little tail falls off or flies away. Namibia's geological development began about 2,000 million years ago and was built on volcanic eruptions, sedimentary deposits and tectonic movement. The ancestors of the Damaraland people did a remarkable job surviving in such a barren land. Today, the Damaraland community is benefiting because Wilderness Safaris has joined hands with the Save the Rhino Trust, all contributing to a successful ecotourism industry. In fact, one third of Namibia's economy is supported by tourism. The result is that the wildlife populations, the communities, and specifically the desert black rhino populations are all thriving. Desert Rhino Camp is the place to stay if you want to catch a glimpse of this rare desert black rhino. Nice to know uh, chivalry's not dead in the bush. Yeah. <laughs> Namibia is a country of startling contrasts. This is the oldest desert on the planet. And although at first glance, the landscape seems barren, on closer inspection, you'll find an array of desert and plant life. From birds of prey to majestic kudus, each animal is uniquely adapted to survive both the scorching heat of the desert day, as well as the freezing temperatures that take hold of the desert at night. And Harry was right there to give us more information about the unique wildlife. Okay, Michelle, there is mountain zebras in distance. They are the only animal in this area which is drinking water daily. All others, they can skip two or three days. Harry, how the zebra adapted to this heat? Uh, well, the black and white strappings help them with the cooling system. So when it's hot, they give the backwards towards the sun to reflect back again the heat. And if it is cold, then they are facing towards the sun or give sidewards to absorb the heat to keep their body warm. And the white bellies help them from the secondary heat which is coming from the ground. 
What I found really interesting is the fact that zebra have got a 12-month gestation period, which is particularly long. And these Hartmann's mountain zebra are in fact a subspecies of the Cape mountain zebra, which we see all the time in South Africa. Yeah, and we are proud of it, and they are endemic to Namibia. As promised, the trackers maintain constant communication with our vehicle. So Harry, how do we go about finding the black rhino? Yeah, the normally trackers, they live uh, 20 to 30 minutes before us. Okay. And they drive springs to springs looking for fresh signs of the rhinos. Okay. And if they pick up the signs, then they follow it until they find it. Well, let's hope we find them and they're not too grumpy. Yeah, well, you never know what the nature can offer you. So these are free roaming black rhinos and you can't give a guarantee. So we will see what we can find. Okay. Yeah. Don't go away, we'll be right back. She's searching for the truth. Welcome back to Wild Limited. We're visiting Namibia. Basically, this area just outside of the camp is a basalt basin. And basalt is the kind of rock that can hold water underground, which explains why you see so many succulents and trees dotted around that landscape. Also, so many herds of animals dashing across the plains. Now, basalt is rich in iron oxide, which explains the red colouring that you'll see on the rocks. And also very interesting at ground level is that you'll notice with all the heat, with the expansion and the contraction and the wind action, these rocks are literally breaking up right before our very eyes. And I'll tell you what, for a four by four, this is very hard ground, rattling and shaking until that four by four falls apart. <laughs> and from one Namibian wonder to the next, Terminalia prudiotis. Now this can be a bushy-like shrub or it can grow to reach up to 15 meters in height. And it's highly sought after by the rhino. They quite like chewing on it. How you can identify it is by these beautifully colored plum seed pods. And people like it too. They use these seeds to make a, a coffee-like drink. You roast the seed pod and voila. Or of course you can just eat them raw. It also has an incredibly hard wood that makes a wonderful knob carry or a, a walking stick as well. Our trackers have been on foot for more than an hour and with the temperatures rising, they're making use of all their skills to find this elusive and rare animal. Harry, these are the last free roaming desert black rhino in the world. Wow. Yeah, these are the only free roaming black rhinos that you'll find in the world because there is no fence around them and they can move freely as they want. How many are there? Uh, they are plus minus 150 to 170 black rhinos. But uh, in the early 80s, there was only 40 rhinos left. So with the help of Save the Rhino, we have managed to bring it up to 150 to 170 rhinos. So we are protecting it to increase the number for the next generation which are coming up so that they can also see these beautiful black rhinos. And we are the only country which have the desert adapted uh, black rhinos in the world. So we are proud of that. Hartmann zebra can only be found in Namibia, and these truly are our monochromatic friends because they've only got two very clear distinct stripes, a black and a white stripe, whereas the zebra we find in South Africa have got a third stripe, a shadow stripe. And have a look at their legs. You will notice that the stripes go all the way down to their hoof. Hartmann zebra are agile climbers perfectly adapted to live in arid conditions and steep mountainous country. A threatened species, the zebra is unique to the country and a magnificent find. And here we've got some springbok, one of the most common antelope found in Namibia, a little bit bigger than the springbok that we find back home in South Africa. They've got those beautiful cinnamon upper body parts and those striking white bellies, which help them not to absorb the heat from the hot desert sands. And just like the zebra, the springbok align themselves towards the sun with their back parts facing the sun because the white aspect of their body helps to reflect the heat away from them, helping them to be just a little bit cooler. They also are able to change their diet seasonally, so they are both grazers and browsers according to food availability. 
I like to call them the high jumpers of the bush because these springbok can clear a jump that's about three meters high. No easy feat. And so we're off to find our next desert gem. Oryx gazella gazella, or Chemsbok as we know it, is a real icon on the Namibian landscape. And this is one antelope that you're not going to get muddled up with other species because both sexes have got beautiful long straight horns, sometimes reaching up to 125 centimeters. Oryxes are generally grazers, feeding on short grasses and roughage. And also, they've been known to browse on shrubs and trees and even dig up succulent roots and shrubs. Now, this is one antelope species that doesn't need to drink water because they get sufficient moisture from their diet. But of course, if there's water around, they will drink, even to the point where they can tolerate brackish water. The charmer melons are vital when it comes to the moisture that they're getting in their diets. If you have a look at this lovely big charmer melon as we've opened it up, the smell is really crisp and healthy and light. And I suppose if it's good enough for the Gemsbok, it's good enough for us to taste as well. Let's have a little piece. Oh, it's very, very bitter. Mmm. Mmm. I suppose you want me to chew it and swallow it now. Mm -mm. Ah! Not nice at all. I think we'll definitely leave that for the for the oryx to eat. Pa. I wonder how our trackers are doing. Wow. Now look at here. There was a rhino lying here. It's a lovely big animal, it, that. Yeah. Even Harry and I found evidence of desert black rhino activity in this euphorbia bush, a favorite of rhino who enjoy shading and rubbing themselves on the stems. Euphorbia damarana is one of the most common plants in the area. It literally peppers the barren landscape, just like little balls of light green cotton wool. When you visit Damara land, you will quickly learn to identify this plant, not only because it's conspicuous and, and plentiful in the landscape, but also it is incredibly poisonous. However, rhino do love to feed on it, and they have been seen devouring an entire bush over consecutive days. But when it comes to human beings, it's a whole different ball game. If you have a look here, when we break a stem, you'll notice that white milk comes out of it. Now, if you get that white milk in your eyes, it will blind you. And if you choose to suck on this plant or lick it, chew it, it will kill you. Harry, what do we have on record that tells us this is such a poisonous bush? There have been an incident whereby the guys barbecue the meat on the dead branches of phobia, and all of them have died. What about the bushmen? Do they make use of this? Yeah, they use the, the latex milk uh, on their arrows to kill the animals. But after killing it, they cut away that spot. And I suppose we don't know why it is that rhino are able to eat such a poisonous plant. Well, because they have right enzymes for the digestive system. That's why they eat it and they excrete it through the urine. This is incredibly tough going, but we know that we're getting closer because this is the perfect shady spot that the rhino has been lying in. Look all around me here. You can see this is where his full body weight has been. And there's a very, very strong smell of urine. So we're getting closer. The search for the desert black rhino is in full swing, with everyone on full alert in the hopes of catching a glimpse of this rare animal. We've been out here for two hours, and it's just getting hotter and hotter, but still no black rhino. Remember, they don't have transmitters, so we're having to rely on the natural ways of tracking in order to find them. And our trackers are definitely going the extra mile. We're hearing on the radio that they are running all over these mountains trying to find them. And also remember, there are no fences to keep these rhino in a designated area. So they could literally be anywhere. Rhinos without borders. <laughs> Don't go away. We'll be right back. She's searching for the truth. You're watching Wild Limited. The 
temperatures at midday were unbearable, 38 degrees Celsius. And our trackers have been unrelenting, on foot out there, doing their thing, and not even breaking into a sweat. We've been doing this for eight hours, and only now have we gotten a confirmation that there's apparently a black rhino just over that rise. So Harry, you got your walking shoes on? Yes, I have my walking shoes on. I'm just waiting for you. Whenever you are done, then we can start walking. Great, well, we're right behind him. We're walking in a single file right now. As you can see, the track is way in front of us. And Harry and I are not doing a very good job of keeping up. But it's all about being quiet. Remember, we're entering into the rhino's home now. This is his territory. So walk quietly. This walking is really difficult on these loose rocks. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Harry? It's not very easy. It's very difficult. So, Harry, when we make it over all of this rough terrain, yeah. I think it's going to be quite phenomenal at the top of the hill. Yeah, it will be. It's a three-kilometer walk across this rugged terrain, and it's a hot and difficult task. There he is. He's, he's just to the right of the dead tree, directly in front of us. After an eight-hour search, we have finally found the gem of the desert, the desert-adapted black rhino, Dicerus bicornis bicornis. With notoriously poor eyesight, but an acute sense of hearing and smell, coming face to face with the desert black rhino is an incredible thrill. Our trackers have made use of every tracking technique available, but following the rhino is not where their work ends. They quietly start the process of collecting photos and data for their progress report on the population's condition. None of us are moving. We're staying incredibly still. This is because the male is skittish. He's definitely aware of us. He's nervous. And I'm afraid we are particularly close, so... It's all about being calm and quiet.